we welcome you all on a weekend when invariably a lawyer wants to relax but during these testing times one is always having a different set of mind and we have seen during these times that the webinars are the call of the day one is trying to polish his knowledge as a lawyer as a student of law and a students who are studying in the faculty of law a topic a right of redemption as we have requested mr e om prakash a senior advocate of madras high court who is considered to be an epitome of knowledge not only in madras and beyond and that is why the beyond law group thought why not ask a lawyer who is known for his immense knowledge and his erudite style of expressions and during these webinars we have found that whenever we have been in touch with the lawyers and judges from madras i am not saying from other places also their style and expression of knowledge to hammer a point which actually gets well down in the mind has been well received during all these webinars and as mr om prakash is well known with his specialties in banking laws business laws corporate law and redemption with the there are facets in the banking law also which plays an important role and during these testing times we have seen that the banking laws the npas etc is having its own swings because the npas are on the rise but at the same time there are different guidelines etc which are playing its own way and the supreme court of late has held that the npas etc should be kept in abeyance for some time be that as it may the right of redemption under the transfer of property act and the law is evolving with the flux of time every time so at least during these times we can tune ourselves and once all these issues are actually triggered off in the right way though it may not look good for the industry but as they say uh like in the medical industry they say once there is illness they say it's a healthy season for the lawyers once there are npas it might look to be a healthy season though for the industry and for the nation as a whole it may not look to be a good and we all keep our fingers crossed to the effect that the industry should be a boom because a lawyer who is well versed with law would continue to evolve his own niche within its own fields so we all pray for the industry to go well but be that as it may right to redemption is an important facet of law which we all uh, would like to learn the nuances from mr om prakash who has his own youtube and his own series of lex studies which actually motivated us to make a request to sir to give his insights on this topic and he was kind enough to share his knowledge beyond his platform as he is always known to be a large hearted especially when it comes to the issue of sharing knowledge without taking much time and that to on a weekend i feel that uh, i should not be a, a larger taking time consumption part in this aspect introducing a person who is already a larger than life image what do you sir thank you mr vikas good evening everyone of you it's nice being part of this session and i have to thank mr vikas for having given me this opportunity i am just looking at sharing a few thoughts of mine on the topic of the day right of redemption today's session we will try to look at a small brief outline as to how this provision comes into the place of an enactment and how it has traveled over the period of time we may look into the relevant provisions of the tp act which speaks about redemption and we may like to look at provisions of civil procedure code as to how it has got an implication in the process of enforcement before a civil courts then probably we will look at few enactments namely one or two enactments which had dealt with this right of redemption or has an effect on this right of redemption and as to how the law has traveled over a period of time on this subject with specific uh, case laws on it so there will be we are going to be having an introspect on the right of redemption and the march of law as you all know a ownership to a property has many facets of rights attached to it and the rights and obligations arising there too have been provided for under the transfer of property act 
these rights are in the nature of rights to own enjoy alienate lease mortgage assign etc and for each of these facet you have something or other which is said under the transfer of property act in terms of rights and obligations arising there too one such facet is a mortgage being created on a property in favor of a creditor to secure a debt or to perform some obligation now as you all fully aware that uh, the transfer of property act dedicates a chapter on this mortgages it has sub chapters as regarding rights and obligations of the mortgage or mortgagee and it also speaks about charge on the property now various types of mortgages have been set out in section 58 of the act with which we are not much concerned for today's topic but for the fact that we are going to speak on the redemption of these mortgages now suffice to state that the types of mortgages include simple mortgage mortgage by conditional sale usufructory mortgage english mortgage mortgage by deposit of title deeds and lastly the anonymous mortgage the right of redemption is recognized as a statutory right by section 60 of the transfer of property act which has its roots from the principles derived in english law the right of redemption was held to be a right in equity for the person creating a mortgage and he should not he should be able to get back his property once he is ready to discharge the debt so this had been the underlying principle which was dealt with in english law for uh, i need to say it is actually centuries if you look at one of the earliest uh, cases of english law lord magnaton in the case of nohas and co versus rice 1902 ac 24 has this to say about the right of redemption redemption is of a very nature and essence of a mortgage as mortgages are regarded in equity it is inherent in the thing itself and it is i think as firmly settled now as it ever was in former time that equity will not permit any device or contrivance designed or calculated to prevent or impede redemption it follows as a necessary consequence that when the money secured by a mortgage of land is paid off the land itself and the owner of the land in use and the enjoyment of it must be free and unfettered to all intents and purposes as if the land had never been made the subject of the security i unquote these were the words of lord magnaton in the case of uh, 1902 now right to redeem is an incident to a mortgage and is inseparable from it the mortgagee's right to enforce a mortgage is a right to foreclose and the mortgagor's right to discharge and seek for property is the right to redeem now both these rights are coextensive as one right would give rise to the demand for performance of the other as you as i take you through the session of various judgments you will be able to appreciate this point that this coextensive travels throughout now with this small brief uh, background let us see the specific provisions as regarding this right of redemption more particularly under the transfer of property act 1882 now as i said earlier chapter 4 dealing with mortgages of immobile property under the act under the heading rights and liabilities of mortgagor has sections 60 to 66 now the rights and liabilities of the mortgagee starts from section 67 and finally the chapter ends with section 104 though i am putting it across to you about 44 sections won't be threatened that i am going to take you through the entire thing and it is not the need of our hour also in the context of redemption we need to look at a very few sections which is of some importance to us those are sections 60 60 capital a 61 83 and 91 which needs to be looked into now section 60 let us see what it speaks about section 60 speaks about right of mortgagor to redeem now interestingly if you just look at this provision for just for the convenience i will read through this section though it is a bit longer section please take note of it at any time after the principal money has become due the mortgagor has a right on payment or tender at a proper time and place 
of mortgage money to require the mortgagee to deliver to the mortgagor the mortgage debt and all documents relating to the mortgage property which are in the possession or power of the mortgagee and where the mortgagee is in possession of mortgage property to deliver possession thereof to the mortgagor and at the cost of the mortgagor either to retransfer the mortgage property to him or to such third person as he may direct or to execute and where the mortgage has been affected by a registered instrument to have registered an acknowledgement in writing that any right in derogation of his interest transferred to the mortgagee has been extinguished now there is an important proviso provided that the right conferred by this section has not been extinguished by act of the parties or by decree of the court so this is an exception to the first part of the section the right conferred by this section is called right to redeem and suit to enforce is called a suit for redemption now then it says nothing in this section shall be deemed to render invalid any provision to the effect that if the time fixed for payment of the principal money has been allowed to pass or no such time has been fixed the mortgagee shall be entitled to reasonable notice before payment or tender of such money then redemption of portion of mortgage property now we will rest with this portion of the section as you have seen the section makes it clear that the mortgagor has a right as in cases of other provisions where you will find a person is entitled to or a person shall or may you have enough of jurisprudence as to how shall to be read may to be read now all those things doesn't arise here it makes a clear declaration that a mortgagor has a right now when this right comes when the principal money has become due and on payment or tender so therefore the principal amount has to become due in which instance the mortgagor gets a right to exercise his right of redemption by making a payment or tender and which shall be at a proper time and place now on such compliances once the mortgagor comes forward to exercise this right of redemption and he is ready to comply with this now you have the right as a mortgagor you have the right to call upon the mortgagee to deliver it may be the mortgage deed it may be the documents in their possession it may be the possession of the property by itself or it may be to effect a transfer deed or rather a retransfer deed now interestingly the section also says such retransfer can also be sought in favor of a third party and then you can ask for registration of the instrument in discharge of the debt and the redemption of the mortgage now this is what section 60 effectively says now this is the starting portion as far as the right of redemption under the transfer of property act is concerned now section 60 capital a permits transfer including to assign the mortgage debt to a third party the encumbrancer is also entitled to seek for the same so therefore by an enabling provision it says it can be assigned or transferred and such encumbrancer will also step into the shoes now this encumbrancer or this transfer or assign can be by the mortgagor or or can be by the mortgagee also so the mortgagee can assign a debt with the underlying securities a mortgagor can assign his equitable right of redemption now you all know how this assignment sometimes happens is that subsisting mortgage a person may sell the property now the purchaser gets the property with the equitable right of redemption so he is bound to exercise this right and seek for the reliefs now with this let us see what section 61 says 61 provides for redemption separately or simultaneously from the same mortgagee of different mortgages which in the absence of a contract to the contrary so therefore if there is no contract restricting certain things and if there are different mortgages on the same property in favor of the same person 61 comes in aid to provide that you may simultaneously redeem or you may even separately redeem this now having said about these three relevant provisions with regard to the right of redemption let us look at is there any other provisions which speak something related to this now if you just scroll through you will find section 82 83 which has some significance to this section 83 of the act says power of deposit in court money due on mortgage now at any time after the principal money payable in respect of any mortgage 
has become due and before a suit for redemption of the mortgage property is barred the mortgage or or any other person entitled to institute such suit may deposit in any court in which he might have instituted such suit to the account of the mortgagee the money remaining due on the mortgage so this is again in the scheme of things an enabling provision you may have instituted a suit with a plea that there is a discharge or you may have instituted a suit with a plea that i am ready to tender the payment and a situation may arise that you may have to establish your bona fides or the court may call upon you or you may seek a specific remedy in the pending suit so in which case section 83 steps in and it permits that you can deposit this money now the other portion of the same section says right to money deposited by mortgage the court shall thereupon cause return notice of the deposit to be served on the mortgagee and the mortgagee may on presenting a petition verified in a manner prescribed by law for the verification of claims stating that the amount then due on the mortgage and his willingness to accept the money so deposit in full discharge of such amount and deposit and on depositing in the same court the mortgage deed and all documents in his possession or power relating to the mortgage property apply for and receive the money and the mortgage deed and all other documents so deposited shall be delivered to the mortgagor or such other person as aforesaid now you could have seen that it is nothing but a reflection of section 60 within a system when the parties are before the court it again provides as i said the moment you are showing your intention to perform the moment you are showing that in terms of the right which the law enables you to seek for redemption there are obligations on the part of the mortgagee like in this case you have seen that the money is so deposited now if the mortgagee comes forward to accept he has to do so by verifying a petition which is has in the nature of claim and setting forth that he is receiving the money in full discharge then he has to deposit all the mortgage deeds and all documents in his possession and it also says the power relating to the mortgage property now the other limb of this section is where the mortgagee is in possession of the mortgage property the court shall before paying to him the amount so deposited direct him to deliver possession thereof to the mortgagor at the cost of the mortgagor either to retransfer the mortgage property to the mortgagor or to such third person as the mortgagor may direct or to execute and where the mortgage has been affected by a registered instrument have registered an acknowledgement in writing that any right and derogation of the mortgage so you would have again seen the next portion is in respect of the conveyance of the reconveyance of the property trans cancellation of the mortgage deed by a registered instrument which again you would have seen it is nothing but a reflection of what section 60 provided for now let us see there is one more provision which which speaks about this redemption that is section 91 now section 91 is with the heading persons who may sue for redemption now besides the mortgagor any of the following persons may redeem or institute a suit for redemption of the mortgage property namely any person other than the mortgagee of interest sought to be redeemed now when they said any person within brackets they said the mortgagee of interest cannot be that any person so that is excluded so who has any interest in or charge upon the property mortgaged or in or upon the right to redeem the same so now within this encompass of any person you can bring a subsequent mortgagee you can bring in a person who has purchased the property subsisting mortgagee or you can bring in a person who holds certain charge on the property whosoever it may be now so so far as he is able to show that he has an interest in or a charge upon the property he also has a right to seek for redemption now then it says under sub clause b any surety for the payment of the mortgage debt or any part thereof then or any creditor of the mortgagor who has in a suit for the administration of his estates obtained a decree for sale of the mortgage property therefore under section 91 it provides as to the persons who can sue for redemption and who can institute this proceedings before the court of law so these are broadly the relevant sections which i am pointing out i am not getting into the niceties or nitty gritties of each of it i am only trying to give an outline now with these provisions having gone through these provisions of the enactment 
and having seen a small background as to it. Now let us see what are all the principles which are derived from this right of redemption. As I said earlier, the first and foremost principle which you can take note is that this right is created in a statute. Earliest point of time, the law books tell us that this right was a right in equity that takes a shape of a right in a statute. As I said earlier, when you read section 60, it clearly says mortgage or has a right. So therefore, right of redemption is a right created in statute. And the statute states that the mortgager has a right. Now, what flows of such right is also set forth and held by courts to be sarcosant. While the section states it to be a right of the mortgager, the further wordings as to the reliefs to be sought by the mortgager establishes the obligations of the mortgagee to preserve those incidents. When I, said the, when I say this, I mean, suppose if the property has to be put back in possession, the mortgagee has an obligation to ensure that the property is properly preserved and protected. Now the mortgage deed has to be returned back and mortgage title deeds have to be returned back in, in the right of redemption. So all these things cast an obligation of the mortgagee to ensure that are available. Now having said this, the provisions also speaks about part redemption, whether there is, a, as I said, there is a redemption of simultaneously or separately. Now, is there any instance of any part redemption? At the first instance, you can see a person interested in only a share of a mortgage property cannot redeem it by paying a proportional amount of the debt due. So in terms of this, a part redemption is not permitted. Now, this has been uh, affirmed by the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of uh, Changanlal Keshavlal Mehta versus Patel Narendra Bas, reported in AR 1982 SC, page 121. However, when a mortgagee acquires the whole or part of the mortgage property, the mortgager can redeem his share. Therefore, the mortgage property can only be redeemed if the debt owed is paid in entirety and the holder of the share of mortgage property cannot redeem it by payment of proportional amount that is owed. Now, is there any exceptions to this rule? You will find from the jurisprudence which is evolving, there are certain exceptions to this rule. Now, one exception can be that when there are terms specifically provided in the mortgage deed, that there could be a partial redemption, then you are entitled to. Then when co-mortgagers have separate interests, redemption can be made in part. This again will be part of mortgage deed. The mortgage deed may be speaking about what is the right of the co-mortgagers when the mortgage is created. When there is a partition of mortgage property between the co-mortgagers and the mortgagee recognizes the same, then you have a right of partial redemption. When mortgagee acquires the whole or part of the mortgage property, the mortgagee can redeem his share. Now, these are all the exceptions as regarding partial redemption. Now with this, let us get into the other principle which is of a predominant importance. The principle which has been derived from the provisions of the Act is called a clog on right of redemption. Now, having said that a right is created in the statute, namely the right of redemption, can the parties contract to the contrary or any clause of the contract defeat such right of redemption? That is recognized as the principle of clog on the right of redemption. Now, any clause in the contract affecting the right of redemption is held to be void and non-est. Now, a condition that stipulated that the mortgage property would be deemed to be sold to the mortgagee permanently if the mortgagee fails to pay the payment is a clock. Likewise, instances where you can find the mortgage deed providing for accelerated interest rate of a period of time is found to be a clock. And there are so many such instances which are uh, coming forth as you uh, go through various judgments, you will find such instances coming up for consideration before the court. Now, let us see the jurisprudence on how uh, it throws a lot of insights and light as to this doctrine of clog, clog on the right of redemption. One of the oldest cases which you can find on the subject is again an English law. In the case of Verman versus Bethel, 1762 to Eden 110 at page 113, the Earl of Nottington says, I am quoting the portion from the judgment, this court as a court of conscience is very jealous of persons taking securities for a loan and converting such securities into purchases. And therefore, 
I take it to be an established rule that a mortgagee can never provide at the time of making the loan for any event or condition on which the equity of redemption shall be discharged and the conveyance becoming absolute. And there is a great reason and justice in this rule. These lines are very important. It, it makes a lot of sense. It says, and there is great re reason and justice in this rule for necessitous men are not, truly speaking, free men. But to answer a present exigency will submit to any terms that the crafty may impose upon them. I unquote. Now you can see the wisdom of these words. Over centuries, these words still feel, uh, stand to be true. Even till date, if you see cases of people uh, taking a loan or mortgaging their property, this is what matters. At the time of availing these facilities or creating a mortgage over the property, taking a loan from a third party, if you truly speak for them, they are not free men. They only seek to answer a particular exigency which prevails. That exigency is nothing but a kind of financial distress. In fact, my friend Vikas was pointing out to you that at these tough times, uh, you have many NPS which are coming up. At these tough times, you find the banking industry uh, facing the situation of huge defaults. So therefore, on a lighter sense, Vikas was telling that more the NPS which develop, more that the lawyers will have a work on it. But please take note of these words of uh, the year 18, uh, 1792. Now, one more judgment of English law in the case of Stanley versus Wilde, 1899 to Chancellery 474. The founding explanations for this clog on the uh, doctrine of uh, right of redemption is found in this judgment. I quote the judgment, the paragraph of the judgment. The principle is this. A mortgage is a conveyance of land or an assignment of chattels as a security for the payment of a debt or the discharge of some other obligation for which it is given. This is the idea of mortgage and the security is redeemable on the payment or discharge of such debt or obligation. Any provision to the contrary notwithstanding. That in my opinion is the law. Any provision inserted to prevent redemption on payment or performance of the debt or obligation for which the security was given is what is meant by a clog or fetter on the equity of redemption and is therefore void. It follows from this that once a mortgage, always a mortgage. As a lawyer, as a student of law, as a practitioner in courts, we have heard this sentence many a times. Whenever there is a case on mortgage, wherever there is a case on redemption, whenever there is a case on foreclosure, whenever you find cases on conditional sales or people trying to put forth a plea that it was only a mortgage, you will find once a mortgage, always a mortgage. And this words were the words which were found in the case of Stanley versus Wilde in the year 1899. This has been many a times reiterated, including the decisions of the Honorable Supreme Court. Now, these two English law judgments were relied upon by the Privy Council while laying down law in the case of Khan Bahadur Meherban Khan versus Makana and others reported in AAR 1930, Privy Council, page 142. And thereafter, the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Gangadhar versus Shankar Lal and others reported in AAR 1958 SC, page 770, followed the same. In fact, in paragraph 8 of the said judgment, the Honorable Supreme Court has this to say. The right of redemption, therefore, cannot be taken away. The courts will ignore any contract, the effect of which is to deprive the mortgagor of his right to redeem the mortgage. For once a mortgage, always a mortgage, and therefore, always redeemable. Now, having seen the second principle as regarding clog on the right of redemption, let us see a third principle which evolves from the provisions. Now, this will be extinguishment of the right. As I pointed out to you, section 60, I also read to you the Prusio to section 60. Now, the Prusio to section 60 makes it clear as to when this right of redemption stands extinguished. It says that it can be extinguished only by acts of parties. Now, when we say acts of parties, a covenant in a document of mortgage can also be an act of parties. But what the courts have held is that such acts of parties to qualify as a clause of extinguishing the right to provisio to section 60 
must be should be a subsequent act and not any covenants in the contract which would extinguish the right if it is part of the contract then the same is void being a clog in the right of redemption the acts of parties would include the discharge of debt payment received from the usufructory or any other means of discharge of debt like many instances you have different different mortgage deeds where to secure certain money a mortgage is created but parties has between them continue with certain business transactions there will be exchange of certain things and in the process there will be some established fact that the debt stands discharged likewise when the decree of a court provides for foreclosure the right stands extinguished now this aspect of a decree of a court providing for foreclosure has gone a lot of changes uh, with coming into force of special enactments which i am going to take you through in the further portion of this session now the action of the mortgagee for foreclosure had been contentious issue as could be derived by the provision the filing of a suit for the foreclosure may be may extinguish the right to seek for redemption or filing of such suit now but once a decree is passed the change is that a filing of the suit is no more available so therefore a mere filing of the suit may not extinguish what is requirement of the law is that there is a decree in terms of the suit seeking for foreclosure now however in terms of the decree the debt can still be discharged and the property be redeemed now likewise even in the execution of such decrees until the property is sold registered and transferred in full the party has an opportunity to deposit the amounts and seek for discharge and redemption of the property now this portion of it is not part of section 60 now this portion of it is part of the uh, mechanism or procedures in terms of the suits that you will find in the provisions of the civil procedure code now honorable supreme court in the case of uh, chenganlal keshavlal which i referred earlier which is in fact reported in 1977 sec 247 held that the mortgage or as a right of redemption unless the sale of the property was complete by registration in accordance with the provisions of the registration act now interesting case would be that this is a case where a suit for foreclosure is filed decreed and in terms of the decree a preliminary decree and final decree and finally it goes for execution and in an execution a sale is happening but still when the party comes before the court and says that i am ready to deposit this money the question as to whether this right of redemption stood extinguished or not was a consideration the honorable supreme court said the provisions would say that till the time of transfer the right of redemption is not extinguished rather the person has a right to make the payment and discharge the debt and take back his property and that transfer the supreme court said will be complete only if a registration of the sale is happening so till such time if it is not done the opportunity for the person to redeem the property continues now when a question of whether there could be a relinquished based on endorsements made so as to stop the party came for consideration the honorable supreme court in the case of uh, reported in year 1982 sc 122 held in the negative saying that the endorsement cannot amount to extinguishment and there cannot be any estoppel against statute now that is a case where the mortgager by themselves has and when the mortgage send them a note of the subsisting debt made an endorsement that we are not interested in redemption now this continued once or twice now interestingly still the mortgagee did not seek for foreclosure so during which period the mortgagor sold the property and the subsequent purchaser stepped in and they petitioned the court saying that i have a right of redemption i have a equitable right of redemption therefore permit me to redeem the mortgage and take back the property this was resisted by reference to the endorsements made by the original mortgagors but the court had negative saying once a mortgage is always a mortgage and there cannot be an estoppel against statute and all these grounds the parties had a right to seek for redemption now let us get into the other principle which comes out as regarding this right of redemption which is on the provisions of limitation act now the interesting feature while considering the right of redemption is that the limitation period in case of right to foreclose is under article 62 of the limitation act which provides for 12 years while for the redemption of the property of the mortgage the limitation period is 30 years as provided under article 61a of the limitation act because while article 61a provides a limitation for redemption as 30 years in sub clause a in b c d there are other instances 
which have been provided with different period of limitation. Now, in the first instance, the period reckoned from the date when the money sued for becomes due, which is the case of right to foreclosure under Article 42. And in the second instance, which is the right of redemption, the date is reckoned from the date when the right to redeem or to recover possession accrues. Now, in the case of Gangadhar Dhar versus Shankarlal and others reported in AR 1958 SC 770, the deed provided for a term of 85 years. It said the mortgage shall be redeemed after 85 years. And it said the right to redemption shall be six months thereafter. Now, interestingly, a suit was brought about for redemption in about 45 years with a contention saying that uh, the, this term of 85 years, which is stipulated, is a clogged on the right of redemption. Now, this was resisted with an interesting plea saying that the suit for redemption is barred by limitation. Now, on the other issue, the Honorable Supreme Court held that the suit is premature and right to redeem does not accrue before the agreed term of the mortgage. And the Supreme Court proceeded to say that the contention that it was a clog on right of redemption was not correct. It cannot act as a clog. And it also held that there is no question of bar of limitation because the suit itself was premature. The Honorable Supreme Court further held that the six months after the term of mortgage is a clog on the right of redemption. So therefore, at the first instance, it said you could not have come to the court at this stage. At the second instance, it said after 85 years, your limitation will start and the six months term cannot come in your way. Now, the reference of other judgment on the limitation is the case of Singram versus Shio Ram reported in AR 2014, SC 3447. I am not dealing with it in detail. I'm just giving the case law for you to get into it because it's a lengthy judgment on usufructory mortgage as well as anomalous mortgage and the limitations which flow out of it. Then in one interesting case, a full bench of the Honorable Gujarat High Court in the case of Sangar Gagu Dula versus Shan Lakshmi Band reported in AAR 2001, Gujarat 329, held that a clog on right of redemption is void of being issue, but it further held that it needs to be declared by a court and the limitation starts from such date of declaration. So this seems to be an interesting point because though the courts repeatedly held if there is a clog, it is void. But still it says uh, it, it is void of an issue, needs to be declared by a court. You need to test it before a court of law. Now with this, I will now take you through the provisions governing legal remedies, rather legal proceedings as regarding this right of redemption. Now, one area which you can look at is the uh, Code of Civil Procedure 1908, where you have a specific uh, chapter dealing with the mortgages. Now, interestingly, Section 85 of TP Act originally provided for procedures in suits for foreclosure, sale, and redemption. Now, that provision was uh, repealed on the coming into force of the Civil Procedure Code because the Civil Procedure Code dealt with comprehensively in order 34 as to the suits relating to mortgage of immobile properties. I will not trouble you taking through all the rules. Suffice for you to just note about rule 1 to 15 are provided in order 34 and every rule has some importance or other as regarding this right of redemption. Please take the case of rule 7 which speaks about a preliminary decree in redemption suit. Now the code sets forth as to what the court shall pass as a preliminary decree in a suit for redemption. I'm just reading that sub rule, which says, in a suit for redemption, if the plaintiff succeeds, the court shall pass a preliminary decree ordering that an account be taken of what was due to the defendant at the date of such decree for principal and interest on the mortgage, the cost of suit, if any, awarded to him, and the cost of charges, expenses properly incurred up to the date in respect of the mortgage security together with so-and-so, and declaring the amount so at that date. And this is more important. The subclause C says, directing that if the plaintiff pays into court the amount so found or declared due on or before such date as the court may fix within six months from the date on which the court confirms and countersigns the account taken under clause A, or from the date on which such amount is declared in court under clause B, as the case may be, and thereafter pay such amount as may be adjusted, adjudged due in respect of subsequent clause and so on. So effectively under the subclause C, it provides a time period by which time the party can still deposit the money before the court and seek for redemption of the property. Now, ultimately it says, this provision says, 
now on compliance of all these things shall if so require retransfer the property to the plaintiff as at as it at his cost free from the mortgage and from all encumbrances created by the defendant or any person claiming under him where the defendant derived claims to title so on so so forth so this is how this civil procedure code also provides for it then final decree in redemption suit final decree in redemption suit also specifies as to on the passing of preliminary decree what happens and effectively if there is non compliance of this preliminary decree the final decree provides that the property can be brought for sale and it can be sold now with this is there an end to it effectively these final decree proceedings will further continue with an execution proceedings to go on as you are aware even in the execution stage cases where properties are attached and brought to sale or cases where properties in enforcement of mortgage resulting in the final decree is brought to sale the code again provides for certain provisions which enables to seek for setting aside of the sale on deposit namely rule 89 under order 21 then rule 90 application to set aside sale on grounds of irregularity or fraud then 92 specifically provides as to when the sale becomes absolute or to be set aside now after compliance of all these things now 92 says effectively if the applications has provided under 89 90 91 are disposed of then sale becomes absolute then then it proceeds to rule 94 which is the certificate to the purchaser so till such time this right of redemption at instances and on certain compliances continue with this now in the case of alokam peddababaya versus others uh, versus alahabad and others reported in ar 2017 sc 3069 and the equivalent of which can be found in 2017 8 scc 272 the honorable supreme court considered the question of right of redemption of a subsequent purchaser of the property after the sale and execution of decree now interestingly this judgment in fact the supreme court said the right of redemption is lost but you can have an nnf a jurisprudence on all the tracing of case laws on this points uh, in this judgment that was an interesting case where uh, a person having failed the debt a suit for foreclosure is filed thereafter he goes and sells the property to somebody the per person who had purchased the property at the first instance institutes a suit only for a bare injunction that the mortgagee should not in any manner affect his right to possession or enjoyment then ultimately finds that there is already a foreclosure suit decreed and in terms of the decree proceedings for sale is taken he withdraws the suit then files a fresh suit for suit for redemption where in fact includes the bank as a party who held a mortgage and the bank having filed the suit for foreclosure Now in that case, the court found that the person was well aware even at the first instance when a suit was filed, and he did not seek for redemption. And in the second suit, the foreclosure suit has come to an end. In terms of the uh, final decree, sale has happened, sale certificate has been executed. So therefore, the court held that the right of redemption is lost. Now, having seen uh, the 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 right of redemption under the Transfer of Property Act and a few judgments which I have pointed out, now let us see uh, how the march of law is that. and in reference to is there any specific statutes which touch upon this i am only just going to point out two special statutes which deals with certain rights as regarding this right of redemption or which affects this right of redemption in some manner now on this uh, special statutes at the first instance you can have a look at the state financial corporation act 1951 and uh, next for our consideration would be the securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of security interest act which is shortly known as surface act now in the case of state financial corporation act the enforcement of mortgage is part of a mechanism provided under section 29 of the act you must be well aware as uh, uh, students of law or as advocates that uh, section 29 provided a right to the state financial corporation to proceed against the industrial units to take possession of the industrial unit and to sell the same without any intervention of court for realization of the dues and that steps in once there is a default committed by the industrial unit now which which in section 29 as provided in the state financial corporation act uh, is on the context there is a default committed by the borrower now by such provision the financial corporation was entitled to take possession of the assets and deal with the same by sale or lease now it did not in specific terms speak about uh, anything on the right of redemption and therefore 
the moment the sale happens the question of right of redemption steps in or prior to the sale when the enforcement happens in terms of 29 the question of right of redemption steps in and in in terms of the provisions of that state financial corporation act what is in aid for the person for the mortgager is again section 60 of the transfer of property act and the discussions we saw have so none of these uh, provisions or these rights which had accrued and the rights which have been declared by the court have been affected as far as the uh, provisions of the state financial corporation act now similarly under the state financial corporation act section 31 provided for enforcement of claims by financial corporation by approaching the district judge by filing a petition for sale of the assets this right was uh, without any manner affecting the rights under the section under section 29 in the set process where the state financial corporation petition the district judge for enforcement of the mortgage the question of right of redemption also comes up for consideration now one case law which i could lay my hands is that a case of achama siriya versus state financial corporation reported in ar 1997 kerala 75 the honorable high court of kerala considered various issues as regarding this enforcement under the state financial corporation act and held that in exercise of power under section 31 if the property is sold without an attachment the same is illegal and that the right of mortgager to redeem the mortgage is not lost since the sale was found to be void and that there is no foreclosure of the mortgage right of redemption was found to be continuing and not extinguished now interestingly from this judgment what you find is that even post sale if there is a challenge to the sale and the sale is held to be void or illegal the right of redemption resumes you you continue to the right of redemption now the other point which we have to take from this judgment as to the interpretation of state financial corporation act is that the right which is being exercised under section 29 is not equated to a suit for foreclosure of mortgages it is a specific mode of enforcement is what the court found so therefore in terms of it if a sale has happened and if the court ultimately comes to the conclusion that the sale is illegal it revived the right of redemption to the mortgager now this is on the first instance of the state financial corporation now let me take you to the second special enactment which i referred namely the surface act now unlike in state financial corporation act surface act specifically provided for the right of redemption section 13 of the surface act speaks about enforcement of a security interest created in favor of the secured secured creditor on a secured asset without the intervention of the court this was a special enabling provision the historical background to this you must all be aware that at when a particular point of time the nps were mounting special enactment for deciding the banks suits and financial institutions came in the nature of the Uh, rdb act which is recovery of debts due to banks and financial institutions act in the year 1993 and with not much of an progress having made in that and with the mounting nps the uh, government came forward with the surface act giving lot of powers to the banks and financial institutions now in this section 13 and the rules underlying the act provided for the mechanism as to the enforcement which starts with a demand notice at the first instance to be issued in terms of section 132 where the borrower is called upon to discharge his liability within a particular period of time now on failure to comply with this demand the act further provides for an exercise uh, for a right to be exercised by the a specialized person called authorized officer who will take possession of the secured asset which is effectively a mortgage property and such exercise is under section 134 now while further action for sale is also provided under section 134 now interestingly a subsection 8 is introduced to section 13 which provides for a right of redemption which is more in the nature of a restrictive clause as you have seen under the transfer of property act section 60 provides for the right of redemption now while we speak about section 13 of the surface act you can find the wordings 13 starts with the wordings of an non obstante clause saying not withstanding what has been provided under section 69 of tpr so it doesn't override the all other provisions it only says section 69 now having said that a kind of a restrictive clause is introduced which in fact uh, differs from what is provided under section 60 of tpr now this is subsection 8 of section 13 
the said section originally provided for right of redemption to extinguish on the property being sold in the auction in exercise of powers under section 13.4. So original section 13, subsection 8 provided that if the dues of the secured creditor with interest, cost, charges, everything is tendered to the secured creditor at any time before the date fixed for sale or transfer. You need to note that word for sale or transfer. The secured assets shall not be sold. So this was the protection of right of redemption provided under 13.8. So therefore, cases where properties were brought for sale, still the borrowers had the right of redemption. Cases where the properties were in fact sold, but the transfer did not happen in the means of a registration of the sales certificate not having happened, or in cases where delivery of possession has not having taken place. So therefore, an interpretation was made that the transfer is not complete, there is no transfer, and the right to redemption still survives, which was accepted by the courts in terms of this provision. As I said, this is what originally stood, because there is an amendment which has come to it, which I will also point out. Point out. Now on this, let us see uh, what the Honorable Supreme Court had to say. I will only point out to the judgments. I will not trouble you taking through that. As to the impact of this uh, section, subsection 8 of section 13, and the case laws on this are Matthew Varghese versus Amrita Kumar, reported in two, 2014, 5 SCC, page 610. Dwarika Prasad was a state of Uttar Pradesh and others, AR 2018 SC, page 1286, equivalent is 2018 5 SCC 491, and Shakina and others versus Bank of India, 2019 11 scale, page 59. Now, as I said, these few judgments which I'm pointing out, which throws enough jurisprudence on this right of redemption as envisaged under the Surface Act. Now, subsection 8 of section 13 was amended by Act 44 of 2016. And this came into effect on 1-9-2016. Now, wherein, now the, this right of redemption is slightly modified. Now, the amended provision says, where the amount of dues of the secured creditor together with all costs, charges, expenses incurred by him is tendered to the secured creditor at any time before the date of publication of notice for public auction, or invite quotations or tender for public auction or private treaty. Now the time limit has been restricted to mean that the right of redemption stands extinguished after the date when a publication of sale notice is made. So the right of redemption is made to survive only at any time before the date of publication of notice. In a manner, the Honorable Supreme Court in the Sakina case has also taken note of this amendment and in fact has referred to it. And effectively now, the right of redemption provided under Section 60 of the TP Act till the transfer as per the judgment of Honorable Supreme Court is restricted to till the date of publication of notice of sale. So these are the areas of special enactment which had some bearing on the right of redemption. And as I said, as I took you through the entire process, I also pointed out some judgments to understand as to how the march of law is there. So with this, I make a conclusion to the session. The march of law in terms of the specific enactments, judgments of the court continues. The right derived from the law of equity in the English courts took the shape of a statutory right, traveled with times and continues to have a force subject to the restrictions under the special statutes. Now, a lot of jurisprudence is also available in the nature of equitable right of redemption in the hands of purchasers, assignment of rights by the mortgagor and mortgagee. And as students of law, hope this is interesting and kindles your thought process to seek for more. As you are aware, there are so much of instances where these assignments happened by the mortgagor, mortgagees. And as I also pointed out, one lot of jurisprudence is on the point of the subsequent purchasers coming in and claiming and you can see of late, there are even contentions raised that once a mortgage is there, you cannot even sell, but that is not the law. A sale can happen and the purchaser will have the property with the equitable right of redemption. And it is up to him to en enforce such right and seek for redemption on failure. He also loses the right. Thank you very much. Thank you for having spent the day with me. And I think it was useful to each one of you. 
and if there is anything which you need to have as a clarification or any questions to my ability and best of my knowledge i will be able to do so uh, uh, thank you sir so once uh, sometimes the lecture is so spellbound that people even uh, tend to forget the, uh, to post the questions because uh, invariably everybody is posting that kindly share the citation that we would make a request that your office could just share the citations we can post it on the whatsapp group of our john law cnc i'll just check out because here we have not got any uh, uh, any other questions i can just check it on the facebook so since you had uh, yes uh, one ashokpati has posted the provisions of cpc in for redemption or foreclosure is substantial pro substantial or procedural if it is procedural as it is in cpc what is your view on booz allen's case where supreme court has held to be a substantial uh, to be a substantial law so you heard that question yeah sorry i i went on mute i couldn't turn mute yeah yes sir it says the uh, this is by shopati the provisions of cpc see in for the procedural as it is in cpc yes uh, what is your view on the booz allen's case where supreme court has held that it is a procedural law or is a substantial see it is law? in fact as far as this right of redemption substantial provisions are under the transfer of property act subject to whatever special statutes which i had pointed out so that is the only provisions which are substantial in law though cpc is only in procedural it gives you a window that is what i said it gives you a window to access for example you cannot have a suit based on that provisions of the cpc but at the same time you so this is why yes uh advocate i ask fazul boy what are the rights of a purchaser Uh, in an auction, are they subjugated to the rights of the mortgager? Rights of the purchaser in an auction. The next portion. What is the question? Uh, so this is. What are the rights of a purchaser in an auction? Are they subjugated uh, to the rights of the mortgager? No, it depends on what kind of enforcement it happens. Uh, an auction purchaser may come. in a case of a civil decree auction purchaser may come in cases of uh, special enactments like surface or state financial corporation and auction purchasers in a so each of the statute has got certain rights now this is evolving take the case of surface you have judgments which said that uh, the auction purchaser takes the property with whatever rights which are uh, inherent on the land for example if a charge is created or an attachment is there it continues but over the period of time you have judgments as a march of law which says that the attachment stands extinguished or the statutory charges which are there it stands extinguished now case of liquidation or cases under the ibc it takes a different shape where all claims are called for therefore it doesn't follow so it all depends under what statute and in what manner the property has been sold and how the auction purchaser has taken it in fact in one of the latest judgment of supreme court it 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 records a fact that that there was a clause in the auction sale notice those statute provide something different the auction sale notice clause said that the bank will take care of all the sales tax dues and any other charges and attachments which are there on the property auction purchaser will take care so then the supreme court said this is uh, something uh, contrary to the contract this is something which is provided by you as a contract between the parties so that exchange of communication or the terms in the sale notice was held to be a contract binding on the parties and supreme court said you are bound by that so it depends on the situation they just like where in the auction proceeding they say as is where is basis yes. then dispute arises that the whether the electricity bill has to be paid by the person who is buying it on the as is where is basis or do the charges which stand prior to that and which have not been actually mentioned in the uh, sale notice what is the effect of that no one encumbrances is one actually mentioned in the sale notice now the other area is that what is to be differentiated and seen is on priorities if there are enactments which provide for priorities whether it continues or not then 
whether the right travels with the property or it gets extinguished. If right travels with the property, auction purchaser is bound by that. That is where lately the Supreme Court also said, in a case of electricity dues and property dues, the court said that it travels with the property, therefore it is auction purchaser is bound to discharge that. Cases where attachment or statutory dues, the court again said that it is in terms of special provisions under that, therefore either it gets discharged or it gets merged with the purchase money which has been received. So ultimately whether the money which has been realized by enforcement has to be taken by X person or Y person. So it depends on those situations. Abhishek Sharma in the registered land and uh, an equitable mortgage. Can equitable mortgage be protected by the entry of a notice against the mortgage registered title as to the enforceability of the equitable mortgage against third parties? Uh, he is probably asking whether there can be a registration of this equitable mortgage. Uh, probably wants to ask that as to, he says yes. Okay. See, this is again, you have two specific provisions on the transfer of property. Act. One is priority of mortgage, the other one is postponement of mortgage. There can be instances of a registered mortgage and there can be instances of a mortgage by deposit of title deeds. But off late, you can find in many state, state enactments even this deposit of title deeds, which is evidenced by a memorandum, is made compulsorily registrable. Therefore, it falls within the entries. Now, if it is not within the entry, then again, it has to work out on priorities. Who is the first mortgagee? Who is the second mortgagee? Depending on which, the rights flow. Uh, this is by uh, Subhat Singh Vahida on the Facebook. Mortgage by way of uh, deposit of title deeds, the index to uh, issued by the registrar office in such instruments, relating to the deposit of title deeds indicates titles are to be returned within three months. What does it mean? Title deeds are to be returnable in three months on discharge or? It is silent. I can ask him to uh, clarify that position. Okay. But we see. So unless that is clear, we will not be able to answer that. No problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is by Monish Manin. He says, uh, what is marshalling, sir? Because marshalling is also one of the issues which keeps on coming to, uh, coming to being, due, especially during the securitization proceedings. Yes. Uh, this has not taken a clear case law as of now, but it requires as far as Surface Act is concerned. Under the earlier enactment by before the civil court, you have enough of uh, jurisprudence as to how this marshalling happens. Now, specific provisions of transfer of property also provides for it. Now, as far as surface or the later special enactments, we have to enable certain areas where this marshalling will aid the persons. Now, otherwise, how it operates is in terms of the provisions. Let me just point out to this section. If you see at the section what it provides for, we will be able to have a small understanding. Uh, let me just read that. See, two sections which you can look at is that uh, section 81. Marshalling securities. If the owner of two or more properties mortgages them to one person and then mortgages one or more of the properties to another person, then subsequent mortgage mortgagee is, in the absence of the contract to the contrary, entitled to have the prior mortgage satisfied out of the property to properties not mortgaged to him, so far as the same will extend, but not so as to prejudice the rights of the prior mortgagee or any other person who has for consideration acquire an interest in any of the properties. Now, the essential thing is that if there is a contract to the contrary. Many a cases when, when the uh, questioner speaks specifically about Surface Act, you can find this, there will be a contract to the contrary. In all bank transactions, you will find that you don't, they don't provide you this uh, benefit of having a marshalling. They don't provide the mortgages as separate. They will always have an extension clause. In addition to that, continuity of security is part of the loan documents which, is, which, are, which are obtained. So therefore, in absence of contact to the contrary, it is the mortgager's prerogative to insist that you have this property discharged so that I will have the other property. You have this property foreclosed or sold and I have the other property. So this is how the law operates. And uh, interestingly, it, it reads to evolve in, in cases of special enactments. There was one Supreme Court that I was just checking it out. We had a lot of discussion on that marshalling. Yes. That was of some builder there, I recollect. While giving reference of Section 56 of the DP Act. 
marshaling by subsequent purchasers is section 56 yes sir yes yes but there was one supreme court judgment it uh, had dealt lot on to the marshaling of section 56 probably that was on 2010 i think it should have been jp builders ah uh, must be correct because that that was one of the judgment which discussed in extent so what is marshaling under section 56 correct uh sale certificate made to the decree holder what is the remedy right provided under the special act is reconveyed uh original owner can invoke before act or court original owner yeah once a sale certificate has been issued now unless the sale is questioned in the context of right of redemption you don't have any remedy so, uh, the context of yes uh, so you can continue uh, if it is in the context of Uh, the sale process or some challenge to the sale certificate like instances where uh, sale certificate not being registered or uh, whether it requires registration or not is been a question which is again debated so much of judgments on the point also and and a question of the sale certificate having been on a on an illegal sale for example irregularities material irregularities are on the face of record so these will be the issues which can be if it is under special enactment only before the special tribunal you cannot go to a civil court if it is under the civil courts decree you have all the provisions which you have to invoke under order 21 only beyond this there is no other scope or order 21 rule 89 and 90 yes yes Which and I, that... then again as i pointed out now if it comes to the stage of 92 where a certificate is already issued you have a big question to be answered but sometimes it so happen that uh, the uh, the court does not grant a stay let's assume uh, in a red petition and the property is sold in an auction property is confirmed and at the first instance there are allegation that there is a irregularity while declaring it as an npa while going for the proceeding the 15 days notice was not given or the valuation was not done for the property the way it should have been done but in that eventuality once the property is confirmed so what will be the remedy a fresh rate or that rate itself will suffice no difficulty is what is the remedy or the fees if a writ was only on a point that you don't allow registration see at the first instance if the remedy is sought is on the sale notice or sale process then there is something protected because ultimately if it is declared illegal your right to redemption gets revoked which i refer to the judgment of the kerala high court in the case of state financial corporation act so therefore the remedy which is sought is important like i pointed out in the other judgment of supreme court where they said at the first instance a suit is filed only for bar injunction and later point of time you come for with a suit for a redemption so then you lose it if the first writ petition is on the question of sale two questions come up one is that without going to drt via writ then supreme court judgment steps in saying that the high court should not entertain any writ petition you are likely to lose on it and if suppose the high court permits you to go and agitate before the drt that right continues and you agitate by seeking a relief against the sale either there should be a challenge to the sale notice or a challenge to the sale process which had happened in absence of these two if there is a challenge only to the sale certificate be it registration or be it issuance or be it taking possession then by all means you are likely to lose everything because the right of redemption is getting lost by the time Uh, by Abhishek Sharma, there are no clauses or fetters on the mortgage equitable property rights to redeem the proper, uh, mortgage. Which factors the court will take into account when considering whether the term of the mortgage is oppressive or unconscionable, or should be struck down? Term of the contract, if it is oppressive and unconscionable, the courts have repeatedly held that it amounts to a clog on the right of redemption. This is very clear. That is where they said. such terms are void ab initio so the clog or fetter it depends on each case and each facts which emanate from a particular case ultimately what derived from the provisions of law and the judgments which we have in fact seen in this session is that any clause to the contrary or any covenant in a contract or a mortgage deed which seeks to put a fetter on the right of redemption is held to be void ab initio therefore a clog Thank you.
last question, I think. Yes. No. Yes, sir. So, uh, as the, so we had talked of right to redemption and we had said that the interplay between the Securitization Act, the Debt Recovery Tribunals Act of 1993, plus the Transfer of Property Act. The interplay between all these three acts, more specifically, though you also touched the, the State Financial Acts of 18, uh, 1951. I don't know about Madras out here, it's 1951 of the SFC Act in Punjab. We call it the State Financial Corporation yes. Acts of 19. And Section 29 and 30 is primarily dealt with. I don't know about the Madras. Probably it should be Section 29 only. 31 is also there in terms of petition to the district judge. Yes. But mainly petitions are uh, mainly petitions hover around section 29. Section 29 is an action by themselves. Yes, it just like section takes possession, just like Surface Act, which had 31 is brought before a court. Yes, uh, so uh, the, and the side side interplay is very interesting. Section 60 of TP Act, and the area which I did not touch upon is the uh, recovery of debts due to Banks Act, and then the Surface. Now, in Recovery of Debts Due to Banks Act, this right is recognized in terms of the actions by the recovery officer, which is pursuant to second schedule and third schedule of the Income Tax Act, where again you have Rule 60 and 61 as to when a property is brought to sale, you can petition the recovery officer to say that, don't proceed with the sale, I'm depositing this money. So that is how that right is protected, though it is not in terms of the Civil Procedure Code, it is under specific uh, provisions under the Income Tax Act which is the enabling provision for the recovery officer in terms of the RDPD Act. And in Surface Act, as I pointed out, this 13-8 travel with an amendment itself has a clear interplay as between 60 and Surface Act. Yes, but in, in fact, uh, except for the agricultural land, etc., large number of interests are protected and they are invariably sold in, uh, in the proceedings under Section 13 only. And, uh, and there's a lot of... Uh, now the interference under Section 17 has also has drastically reduced. Yes. What initially used to be there because the banks have also realized that it has to be sold off and uh, you have to give the auction uh, notice in two newspapers, a specific notice. Notice has to be through the authorized officer, the chief manager and above. All that gamut which the lawyers could just uh, take the plea that it has not been sold. Mostly the difficulty is that when you go before the DRT under 17, at the first instance to get a stay, there is a condition. So there it starts the difficulties, 25%, 50% deposit. And you go to the appellate tribunal, again, there is a deposit. So this is where it be, which has been a very challenging thing. Though you may have so much of uh, uh, facts on K hand, hand and you may be able to demonstrate the illegality or irregularity. Some, somewhere people have to not able to get that remedy because of these fetters. But large number, despite the fact that there is a judgment of transco and common line, common thread running between the various judgments, still sometimes the high court interferes, especially once you're able to demonstrate that I'm uh, willing for the OTS. Yes. Uh, this is by Jubay Sheikh. Mortgage by way of deposit of the title deeds. Notarized mortgage can exercise right of foreclosure or registration of mortgage. Deed compulsory and notice of foreclosure, is it necessary? Yes, compulsory and notice of foreclosure is necessary. There is no doubt about it. And if the mortgage deed provided for a private sale treaty in terms of 16 NEA, enforcement can happen. Or if it is a special enactment, it happens. Otherwise, suit is the only remedy. And then uh, the last question by Pohan Ram. Uh, after court sale and subsequent sale, whether section 144 is applicable? 144 of? I think it should be CPC. I will just check it out. He has not written, but I am I'm seeing. Most probably it should be a CPC. CPC 144 only about yes, sir. Uh, Section 144 of CPC it should be. Though he has not written, Section 144 enables the successful party to be placed in the status quo NP and empowers the court to order restitution when a decree or an order is varied or reversed in any appeal, revision, or other proceedings. Now, what is the question uh, by the part? Yes, I will just. Referring to 144, what is that he wanted? A court sale as well as? I'm just checking it out. After court sale and subsequent sale, whether section 144 is applicable? 
again i think we need some clarity after court sale is one instance and there is also subsequent sale so therefore we will assume this subsequent sale is a private sale so there is one court sale which has happened and subsequent sale is a private sale so in this what is the issue by which 144 can be invoked will be the problem so we may have to get more facts to answer that that's true yes uh, sometimes the typing on the facebook etc you are not able to post the question the way it should happen so uh, thank you sir for all the insights uh, given by you to a facet of law which is quite otherwise mind boggling but the the ease with which you have been able to substantiate and put the words across uh, i think lot of clarity over hearing it for the first time would definitely be there and those who are already dealing in the subject the as we say that Uh, whatever the one may, wants to, intends to make the statue the chisels of the mindsets which are to be we once we use the chisel to brush off the extra which have uh, extra things which have been blocked in the mind are brushed off once there is a good speaker to give the insights and thank you for all the insights and tomorrow uh, some uh, since we do a lot of webinars beyond the speaking of uh, law itself tomorrow it will be Uh, by an international speaker a internationally renowned a life skill coach he will teach us how to study smart effectively and develop super memory techniques though he invariably takes classes for the colleges and for the uh, entrance examination but we are made a request so that the lawyers could also understand then he in fact shared with me today that he has developed a course where he says you can i can make you learn the constitution of india to understand understand and memorize within five days so do stay connected with us tomorrow at 5 pm uh this is by mr kamlesh chandra an internationally renowned life skill coach he is running the school of change in jaipur so everyone stay safe and stay blessed and on behalf of all those participants who are watching us on live on the facebook as well as on this platform and those who will subsequently watch us on the youtube once we upload this uh, youtube video on the channel of beyond law clc on behalf of all the such participants i thank you sir for giving the insights and we are truly blessed to have the insights from you namaskar and jai hind to everyone thank you very much thank you for everybody thank you